The ocean is a big place. Its mysterious aura as a place of monsters and wonders has long since captured the minds of us humans. Our fragile, air-breathing bodies aren't exactly equipped to deal with the challenges presented by this environment. So, for thousands of years, this world beneath the waves has been tantalizingly out of our reach. For most of human history, our knowledge of what lived in the ocean depended almost entirely on what drifted to shore by the tides, or was brought up from the depths and fishermen's catches. Strange creatures either dead or dying by the time humans were able to see them. The thought of actually observing this underwater domain and encountering its denizens in their natural habitat was seen as downright fantasy. Some of our earliest legends speak of brave heroes who take the plunge into the waters to uncover their mysteries. Some versions of the ancient story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, bear the title, He Who Saw the Abyss. This is in reference to King Gilgamesh's trek to the bottom of the ocean in search of an aquatic flower that will grant him immortality. Tying stones to his feet and holding his breath, he descends into the darkness. The biblical story of Jonah being swallowed up by a massive fish could be seen as another, perhaps unintentional, attempt at a voyage to the unknown depths of our oceans. The deep surrounded me. To the roots of the mountains I sank. This story, although largely fantastical, may have been an early attempt on theorizing how a human might feasibly survive the stresses of the deep ocean by giving Jonah an air bubble within the belly of the great fish. It seems the famous Alexander the Great might have expanded on such rudimentary ideas. According to some legends, the Macedonian general was the first man to gaze at the world beneath the ocean's surface with his own two eyes, supposedly inventing a primitive diving bell made of glass and suspending the airtight vessel from his ship. Sitting inside his new invention, Alexander saw stuff down there that messed him up so bad that he reportedly said upon returning to the surface, the world is damned and lost. I'm just picturing this undefeated war veteran freaking out at seeing a sunfish for the first time thinking it's an elder god, the one place he dared not conquer. Over time, many other submersibles would be constructed and refined, and since those ancient days, we humans have explored much of the ocean. Thousands of unique and outlandish species that no one would have believed if they had not been photographed have been discovered. And yet, we are still only beginning to just get a peek at what remains down there. The true vastness of the oceanic depths has led to many theories as to what else lies within it, still unrecorded by us surface dwellers. One early attempt at exploration, very similar to Alexander the Great's, led to one incident that still to this day remains unresolved. William Beebe was a famous American naturalist who traveled all over the globe studying plants and animals from the late 19th century to mid 20th century. He is probably best known for the extensive research he conducted on birds and his theories on bird evolution, many of them way ahead of their time. Most notably, he predicted the existence of a four-winged dinosaur in the fossil record, 85 years before the discovery of Microraptor, which confirmed many of his theories long after his death. However, Beebe was also well known for his explorations of the ocean. He, along with inventor Otis Barton, constructed the first bathyspheres, a vessel that should be familiar to any fan of Bioshock. These steel submersibles with their distinctive spherical shape were capable of resisting the high pressures of the deep ocean, allowing for one or more human occupants to go further than any human had gone before. The two men formed a partnership of sorts, and over the course of the 1930s, would make repeated attempts to dive deeper and deeper into the depths off the Bahamas. It was dangerous work, no one doubted. The bathyspheres were in no way flawless, constantly at risk of decompression, leakage, and dangerous air quality, among many other problems. Though high-pressure cylinders would supply a rather limited amount of oxygen, nausea and headaches attack the humans inside. Cramped and claustrophobic, many dives left Phoebe and Barton bruised and bloody from the vessel's relentless shaking. You'd have to be insane to attempt what these men attempted, and perhaps they were. Through the bathysphere's thick fused quartz windows, Beebe and Barton would gaze into the abyss, darker than any midnight sky. An electric lamp would send out a very small shaft of light into the gloom. Aside from this, visibility was incredibly limited. On November 22, 1932, five miles southeast of Bermuda's Nonsuch Island in the Atlantic Ocean, Beebe and Barton dove to 2,100 feet beneath the surface. It was here, peering out of the small windows and illuminated by the dim torchlight that Beebe describes in his 1934 book, Half a Mile Down, the most exciting experience of the whole dive. I will let him tell you it in his own words. Two fish went very slowly by, not more than six or eight feet away, 
each of which was at least six feet in length. They were of the general shape of large barracudas, but with shorter jaws, which were kept open all the time I watched them. A single line of strong lights, pale bluish, was strung down the body. The under jaw was armed with numerous fangs, which were illuminated either by mucus or indirect internal lights. The massive man-sized predatory fish, which BB would later dub the untouchable bathysphere fish, resembled larger cousins of the black dragonfish, which are typically no longer than a few inches. The two creatures briefly danced around the vessel and its blinding searchlight, curiously, only to drift back into the darkness, far away from the unwelcome visitors, never to be seen again. One can only picture the awe and wonder, but also fear that might have accompanied this experience, being trapped in a stuffy, cramped metal ball, with the ocean violently pushing in on you at all sides, as a pair of inquisitive glowing alien creatures observe you for the first time, just as you observe them, nowhere to run, over 2,000 feet from the nearest chance at a breath of fresh air. Throughout his dives, BB spotted several other curious and elusive species unknown to science. The Bissell Rainbow Gar, the Pallid Sailfin, the Five Line Constellation Fish, and the Three Starred Anglerfish. None of these have been observed outside of BB's 1930s visits, and quite controversially, BB gave them all scientific names, an action that most of the time involves obtaining a physical specimen for a fellow scientist to verify, called a haplotype. Due to his lack of following protocol, BB's untouchable fish remain unconfirmed by science. Nonetheless, these exceptional marine fauna remain some of the more plausible cryptids out there, more likely to exist than Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. The incident is unlikely to be an outright hoax, considering BB was a pretty reliable scientist by most accounts, and many of the observations he made on other dives have been confirmed by later scientific research. If so, what were these fish, and how come we haven't been able to find them since? You'd expect at least one of them would have ended up in bycatch or something by now. Well, my theory is that some of his untouchable fish species are already known to science, just not by the names BB gave them. A few of them might have been simply misidentified and inaccurately described by the naturalist in the poor lighting conditions and with his admittedly, at the time, not fully functional brain. Is it possible that the pallid sailfin was in fact a species of squid? Perhaps the five-line constellation fish was not a fish at all, but a type of comb jelly or sonatophore. Maybe BB simply incorrectly guessed some of the observations he made. Or perhaps there might be an even more interesting explanation. Maybe the species he described became extinct since the 1930s. Humans have been driving many deep sea species to the brink of extinction, and it has been estimated that around 158 fish species have become extinct since the year 1900. Or maybe they are still out there, just waiting to be rediscovered by some adventurous human. Hey, as I said, the ocean is a big place. Not big enough for a megalodon to keep going undetected, but definitely big enough for other unknown species. And with that, thank you so much for watching this shorter installment of Trade the Explainer. Hope to see you next time.